Okay, let's see. Let's get it. Let's, let's make sure the mic's all up and working. Okay. And we can go over here. So, the music I played at the beginning of this stream here today is an interesting mix. Because it's an interest it's a mix of traditional Japanese music and Western instruments. You hear a lot of piano and stuff like that. And I felt that that was a good sort of musical reflection as to the topic we're here to talk about today, which is the Boshin War, the dawn of the Japanese Empire. The interesting combination of Westernization and uh, reverence of traditionalism that led to a well, led to the creation of the Japanese Empire. Now, when I bring up the topic of a civil war that divides a country between the north and the south, with um, in the eighteen hundred in the mid eighteen hundreds, um, let's see a lot of use of a lot of early uses of Gatling guns. Um, typically for Americans, one war comes to mind, and we are not talking about that war. That war would be the American Civil War, but something that would meet the exact same criteria we're here today to talk about is the Boshin War. So, let's just jump right into this. Let's see. I actually have a lot of notes here today, so I hope it doesn't take too long. But first, um, boom. The, the where in the who, what, when, where, why. Japan. No, Japan really shouldn't need any introduction. Island country in East Asia near Korea. But when we begin our story, we begin it in the final years of the Edo period. Now, Edo is the name of a city that's right about... Can I do this? Yep, I got a map ready here today. I'll, I'll explain more of what the map means later on. But Edo is a city that is in this area. I don't know how well you guys can see that, but um, I can barely see it. It's sort of where you see this white and black flag. This area is where Edo is. Edo is a city, start off as a fishing village, but by the time we start our story, it's slowly getting more prominence because it is the seat of government for the Shogun of Japan. Now, let's see. The Edo period is dominated by peace. After decades of civil war, um, the Tokugawa Shogunate took control over Japan and then entered a period of peace. The Edo period began, I believe, about 1600, which means when we start our story in the 1850s, Japan has gone through about 200 years of peace up until uh, the Boshin War and rebellions that precede it. So, um, let's see. Japan is under the control of the Tokugawa Shogunate. The Tokugawa flag would be the white, black, and white stripes you see over Edo, because I'm using that little flag to represent that's where the Shogun is, that's where the seat of power is. Now, in Kyoto, there is the Emperor. Kyoto is where you see the little Imperial Japanese Navy flag. Uh, technically, there was a better flag I could have used to represent the Emperor, but um, I like that one better. That, that's my entire academic thought process on that. Um, so... For many people, what they know about Japan is that Japan is headed by an emperor. The emperor in Shinto mythology is descent from the gods, the kami, the, from Amaterasu, the, the sun goddess. And obviously the sun plays a big role in Japanese society. Their very flag has the sun on it. So, Radix, what is this? You telling me that the shogun has power in Edo? And uh, the emperor has... The emperor's in Kyoto, but... And Kyoto's in this area... Why isn't the Emperor in charge? Well, that's because the Emperor hasn't had power. The, by Emperor, I mean the throne. The Imperial throne hasn't held power in Japan for... With the exception of... Uh, an exception, There's an exception of three years, but when we begin our story, the, the Emperor hasn't held power since, like, the 1100s. Um, that's because a long time ago there was a war, and the Imperial family supported one group, and then 
they allowed that group to take power and then that group never returned power. But long story short, the Emperor is just a spiritual sort of leader, sort of like the Pope and less like the Queen of England. And the Shogun is who has the real power. Now, because the Emperor is sort of the key figurehead of Japanese society, it's very important that your Emperor doesn't question your Shogun's leadership or else everything's going to start falling apart. Which, by the way, that's, that's the whole point of this video. But for centuries upon centuries, it was tradition for the Emperor to not step into the political sphere. Let's see. Emperor's divine. Now, how about the domestic ways Japan was ruled? How, was, how did things go in Japan? Well, even though there was a shogun, it was a feudal society. So you had more local rulers that reported to the shogun. That is, uh, you had the daimyo. Daimyo ran what are called domains, which are essentially countries. Essentially, the shogun has power over several countries. It's kind of complicated. It's sort of like the Holy Roman Empire. You have all these different independent countries, but they all still report to one ruler. So the shogun leads Japan, but as for the actual running of the country in each little province, aka domain, that's led by a daimyo. These are often noblemen and stuff like that. So the, da the daimyo are expected to follow the lead of the shogun. So another thing to point out is that Japan is in this period of isolation. Basically, in the early 1600s when Europe discovered Japan, they did what Europe tends to do, which is send a lot of Christian missionaries at the country to try to convert everyone to Christianity. And that wasn't received well in Japan. One, the main religion of Japan, Shintoism, is sort of the backbone to Japanese society and culture as a whole, including swearing leader, uh, loyalty to the emperor. So, when you have these people coming in saying, hey, convert to this new religion, you're essentially saying, hey, throw off your allegiances to the emperor, which is an act of rebellion. Uh, second off, Christianity is kind of strict in how it's run, especially in these days. So a lot of Japanese look at it as sort of a cult sort of deal. And also, the Christianity that was coming to Japan was Catholicism, and many Japanese saw Christians, Japanese Christians as people who swore loyalty to the Pope. Therefore, converting so many people in Japan to Catholicism, I almost missed it, Dreadcore says. Well, we're glad to have you. We're, we're glad to have you here. But, um, so the, uh, so having so many people con convert, convert to Christianity in Japan was seen as putting in, like, foreign agents, people who supported the Pope over the Emperor. And ultimately, Japan's like, alright, we gotta get rid of this Christianity stuff, start beheading missionaries, you know how it is, and then began a period of isolationism, uh, or they also call it sakoku. But, um, the isolationism begins as a reaction to the spread of Christianity, which... So Japan closes itself off from the rest of the world. Now, Japan doesn't have that much natural resources, so you might be saying, Radix, how is Japan supposed to close itself off from the rest of the world and expect to survive? Well, there are three trade exceptions that go on here. Uh, first, we can talk about Tsushima. Tsushima is this little island over here. Tsushima was where trade was done with Korea. Not much to say about it. I think Tsushima was like originally part of Korea like hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But at the time of this story, Tsushima is Japanese territory, and they use it as a trading post for Korea. Now, down south, you can't see it on the map, but you have an island called Okinawa. Okinawa is the capital island of another country called the Ryukyu Kingdom. Now, if you're curious, my peeps, my family, would be in two places at this time. At least my Japanese side would be. They would be in the Yukyu Kingdom, which you can't see on this map. And they would be in Satsuma over here. And Satsuma plays a big role in this story. So, you know, <laughs> the, my peeps are going to be playing a big role in this story, where my family comes from. But most of them are from Okinawa, from the Yukyu Kingdom, which is off the map. But the Yukyu Kingdom was technically an independent country that Satsuma took over a while ago. Oh, took over, put in air quotes. It's more of a vassal-type relationship. Um, but through the Yukyu Kingdom, Japan conducted trade with China. Because of how the Yukyu Kingdom and the Japanese relationship worked, um, 
The Ryukyu Kingdom, you could argue, was the only country Japan was maintaining normal relations with at the time. Now, the third exception is a place about over... No, not over here. It's about over here, more like. Called Dejima. Now, when Japan made contact with Europe, and all the European missionaries came in spreading Christianity, one European group did not try to spread Christianity. They just showed up and said, Hey man, I'm just here to trade. I don't care what you guys do in your free time. And that would be the Netherlands. And Japan was appreciative of the Netherlands, the Dutch, for not spreading Christianity. So they said, we will create an artificial island called Dejima. And I have a picture of it over here. Uh, Dejima. Now, creating an artificial island in the 1600s is a very difficult task. But also, you're dealing with the Dutch who have been making artificial islands since the... The 1600s, pretty much, because the water hates the Netherlands. The Netherlands is pretty much just swamp land that's threatening to be overtaken by the sea any day now. So they keep trying to, they call it the reclamation of the sea. They keep creating artificial islands. So an artificial island was created off Japan called Dejima, where the Dutch were allowed to conduct trade with Japan. Today we call Dejima Nagasaki. Uh, let's see. Netherlands at Dejima. Okay, so the Dutch were the only contact Japan held with Europe because they didn't like European spreading Christianity. However, you can understand that in the 1600s, Japanese people are looking at these Dutch people and like, wow, there's a whole continent all the way on the other side of the world where there's these, these white people. And, you know, they have this entirely different language. They have so much more advanced technology. Um, Japan, there ends up being this sort of phenomenon that <laughs> I guess today we would call reverse weebism, where the Japanese are really interested in European, spe European specifically Dutch culture. Um, this thing called rangaku, which means Dutch learning, begins, where it's pretty much to show off your high status and how cultured you are, uh, you would study Dutch culture and the Dutch language. And um, the Dutch language actually sees this huge boom in, like, 1600s Japan, <laughs> which is kind of weird to think about, but that's how it happened. The Dutch are, like, idolized, like, ah, oh, they look at these awesome people in their, <laughs> in their wigs. But that was how Japan existed for a while. This, or keep in mind, this is 1603 is when this policy begins. For the most of the Edo period, you have this peaceful period, isolated, except for those three trading outposts. <coughs> now, that all changes when the Americans show up in 1854, around 200 years later. 1854, the United States shows up, you can just hear the oh oh Jesus what's that I was moving the actual white backdrop instead of the flag you can just hear the star spangled banner oh say can you see arrives in Edo Harbor and is like yo Tokugawa shogunate well of course Americans didn't have a nuanced idea of Japan so it was hey Japan um, we want to open you up to trade, so let's establish some more context here because, you know, America just flies in out of nowhere 200 years later. So let's get rid of Dejima. And that's because the United States is following a policy called Manifest Destiny at this time. The idea that God himself has given the United States the right to move westward. And this, when you think about the psychology of the average American at this time, America won the American War of Independence and got the 13 colonies as states. Immediately after the end of the American War of Independence, the Northwest Territories were ceded from Great Britain to America. So already they're having this idea of, hey, we, we're, we're making our own country. We, Americans already get the idea that they're better than others because they really value democracy and they're one of the few countries in the world that had democracy at the time. And so they begin to have this idea of it's up to us to spread democracy. It's up to us to s go westward um, because Spain and France and these guys aren't taking good care of the region. Um, so Manifest Destiny, a lot of, I've heard it taught to me 
that Manifest Destiny was um, the American idea that God has given them the right to reach the Pacific Ocean, as in to go from sea to shining sea. This is actually a bit of a revisionist idea. The Manifest Destiny is in the direction of westward, yes, but the ultimate goal is just expansion, period. Um, the Manifest Destiny is what... Yes, it w it's what had America expand west, the Louisiana Purchase, the war with Mexico. Um, but it's also the source for the purchasing of Alaska, the conquering of Hawaii, the Spanish-American War. The reason why America decided to annex the Philippines, it, America feels that it has this obligation to expand. God told us this crap belongs to us. Give me. Precisely. Now, if we looked at a map of the world, which I don't have a map on my OBS right now. I guess we can go here. Which direction is America? America would be moving from here this way. They'd be moving westward. So very much so, Japan lies right in the in sort of the target of manifest destiny. It's right there. Um they were bound to make contact it, contact with it eventually. Now, in 1854, the United States knows Japan's in this period of isolation. If you happen to wash up on shore of Japan, odds are you're going to get beheaded. That was sort of a policy they had. Mm. That's thing, everything west of us, yes. Um, so, let's see, where was I? So, they know Japan's isolated. They want to open it up to trade, of course. <laughs> they have to look at sort of, are you qualified to trade with Japan? Are you A, Korean? Well, America's not Korean. Are you B, Chinese? No. Are you C, Dutch? No. So then Japan's like, sorry, can't trade with you. So America goes in <laughs> to just take control anyway. They send this dude called Commodore Matthew C. Perry. Now, it's very interesting because... Perry's arrival in Japan is, like, one of the first contacts between the United States and Japan. So you get to see, like, some differing perspectives here. Here's a photograph of Matthew C. Perry. And, uh, here's a Japanese woodblock print of Matthew C. Perry from that same time. Um, now, America was a heavily industrialized nation by the 1850s. So, Japan, who had not industrialized, saw Perry's ships... And saw them as this freaking monster thing. This massive, huge ship with the face on it. With these pillars of smoke coming out. And they called it, they called them the black ships. Because just seeing these ships stroll up into Edo Harbor is just a terrifying sight to see. When you have no context for what these ships are. Um, at the same time, here is an American depiction of the Americans arriving to meet the Shogun. Um, now, as you can see, Matthew, Matthew C. Perry is the dude in the middle leading the American troops. But uh, I feel they were kind of generous with uh, how they drew Perry. Because I think he seems a lot more fatter <laughs> or well than in the, in the painting of the Americans going to meet the Japanese. Um, let's see. Now, he comes in with all these cannons, and he tells Japan to open up to trade with the rest of the world. Okay, not going to lie, that looked like some kind of racist depiction of a black man as a ship. Well, the ships were black. <laughs> I guess you can kind of argue for the back. But of course, Japan had very minimal contact with black people at this time, so it obviously wasn't intentional. And that's not to say they haven't had contact with black people at this time. I believe the Dutch brought some slaves with them to Dejima. But more importantly, uh, I forget who it was, but one group of travelers from Europe um, gave one of their African slaves to Japan as like a gift, and then they went off on their merry way. And Japan's like, what do we do with this black man? I don't know, let's just make him a samurai. <laughs> and that former slave ended up becoming a, a samurai in Japan. Um... But yeah, that's an interesting little anecdote. But, um, Perry goes to Japan and he says, Open up to trade or we will destroy you with our cannons. The word he uses is destroy, as in wipe out the Japanese 
islands with the cannons. Obviously, he's exaggerating, but the Japanese don't know that. <laughs> now, you're going to see a lot of parallels between the Boshin War and Perry's arrival in Japan to World War II. As in, Japanese are just completely bamboozled by more advanced American technology. One of the reasons Japan doesn't believe that the United States has a nuclear bomb when America threatens Japan with a nuclear bomb to begin with is because they're like, this isn't the first time you've threatened us with technology that later turned out to not be able to do what it can do, you know? And then, of course, the nuclear weapons did what they did. But uh, obviously, 1850s cannons couldn't wipe out the five major islands of Japan. Or the four major islands of Japan. Um, but the Japanese in 1854 don't know that, so they're kind of panicking. Let me check my notes. 1854, United States Navy Commodore Matthew C. Perry arrives off the coast of Edo and demands that Japan end its period of isolation and to open up to trade with the rest of the world. The United States was pursuing a policy of manifest destiny. Essentially, it was the United States alone was blessed by God, and it was God's will that the United States expand its power westward, even beyond the American continent. The sight of Perry's technologically advanced ships startled the Japanese, who referred to them as the Black Ships. Perry threatened to de destroy Japan with his cannons. Uh, Perry eventually left, um, because obviously a country needs some time to decide whether or not it's going to open up to the rest of the world. But he promised to come back to hear Japan's answer. And um, so Japan's like, all right, they have this little eternal in internal debate over whether or not to open up the country to the rest of the world. So they just decide to take a little peek out, look around the continent to see what's been going on in Asia since Japan cut itself off from everyone. Uh, they see that France has begun to colonize um, or destroy them. Yes, or destroy them. Um, Japan Japan takes a look at what's going on. Indochina is being colonized by France. That is Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia colonized by France. India is in this sort of area where Britain's taking over. Spain owns the Philippines. China's getting their crap being out of it because it's having so much uh, influence from foreign countries. Uh, rebellions, death, and war just seems to become a everyday thing in China. And Japan's like, oh god. It very much was the gif where the dude walks into the room with pizza and everything's on fire. <laughs> I was like, Japan's like, what's up, guys? Uh, I have this idea that maybe we should open up to the rest of the world. Oh, God, Jesus. So Japan is like, oh, no, this is going to be a bad thing, isn't it? So many in Japan, including the emperor, uh, Emperor Kolme. This is Emperor Kolme, as we said at the beginning of the stream. Emperor had no power, was... Um, second, like, he was a spiritual leader, but not a political leader. Emperor Kolme see what's, sees what's going on. He's like, no, don't open up the country to, to the rest of the world, to the Western world. You have all these empires being established by France and the United Kingdom. Russia is showing up in the north. And although America hasn't really taken much um, in Asia, I, I think they're coming for us, man. But the Shogun, Iesada, there are like three shoguns in this story. Don't bother to remember the first two. Iyasada shows up and he's like, I'm the leader. And frankly, I don't see any other way. We don't want our <laughs> islands to be destroyed. Um, so, nevertheless, when Commodore Perry returned, Shogun Tokugawa Iyasada agreed to Perry's terms and opened up Japan ah! to westernization. I don't know what that was, what I just did. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm eating potato chips. And I never, I'm never able to talk well after eating. <laughs> um, so when Iyasada says, all right, we can westernize Japan, boom, westernization out the wazoo. Um, is this before or after Liam Neeson went to Japan to spread Christianity? That would be afterwards. <laughs> um, I believe. That's silence, right? Let me double check. It would make sense to be before. Uh, silence. 17th, yes, yeah, 17th century. This is 19th century. Um, so, westernization happens very rapidly. Uh, here is a wood uh, carving, not wood carving, wood block print of some women in a young boy in western clothes. Japan goes through this westernization process really fast. Uh, traditional Japanese culture begins to be stomped upon 
uh, traditional Japanese values slowly recede as Christianity makes a comeback. And, um, let's see. Iyasada's relinquishment of Japanese isolationism led to an influx of Western traders and Western influences that began to change Japanese society, which resulted in an even more disgruntled populace. That boy has swag. Yes, he does. Unequal treaties were signed that gave the Western powers the advantage in trade with Japan. Also, this is important, every year the United States ends up sending a, a diplomatic legation to Japan. And every year the United States uh, diplomatic legation just introduces even more, like a handful of more concepts and ideas and technology from the West. Um, so that, that annual American delegation is pretty much the major factor with trade in Japan, uh, with the westernization of Japan. Um, it's going to stop and we'll see why. So, meanwhile, because the shogun backed down from the Americans, many Japanese perceived him as being unable to defend Japan against the rapid westernization which led to internal hostilities. Yes, because this rapid westernization, Iyasada is not a popular bro. Um, in fact, this... let me make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself. Alright, in fact, because of all this, naturally when you have this reformation movement, you're going to have a counter movement a reactionary movement and with that you get the sono joy or revere the emperor expel the barbarians sono joy revere the emperor expel the barbarians it's sort of a it's not an organized group it's a social movement um where they call for everyone who's like upset in japan wants the emperor to get authority back and they want to kick out the barbarians aka the westerners this is one of the popular uh sort of pamphlets, proto-pamphlets that was given around. Make Japan great again? Exactly. Um, so, this depicts a sumo wrestler just tossing a, a white dude aside. Um, the Sono Joy movement called for a return of power to the emperor, the overthrow of the shogun, and the expulsion of foreigners, and a return to isolation. This is important. The return to isolation and return to isolationism like okay we opened the door joined the party didn't like the party we want to go home <laughs> you know um now the sono joy movement as a reactionary group was violent it committed acts of violence on non-japanese assets within japan regardless of whether or not these assets were material like trade stuff that they you know throw into the harbor 1776 commences again or human life whether they just happen to just stab a British dude on the street with a katana, you know, that sort of deal. Now, though it wasn't, though the Sono, Ju though the Sono Joy movement started independent of him, Emperor Kolme is like, hey, I like this. <laughs> yeah, I like this Sono Joy movement. So he comes out and publicly, <clears throat> he comes out and publicly endorses the Sono Joy movement. Which, I mean, if I was the Emperor and there's this movement saying, Revere the Emperor, I'm like, yeah, I like this. Um, Kolme is also pretty ambitious. He wants to take back political control for the first time in, like, hundreds of years. Ex with the exception of that little three-year anomaly. So Kolme is like, go, son of joy, go! <coughs> and this broke tradition in which it was understood that the Emperor should not involve himself in political affairs. Hashtag, keep politics out of my Emperor. Now... As much as the Sono Joy movement and Emperor Kolme try to dispel the foreign um, influences, it doesn't look like they're going to budge. The American delegation shows up every year with more and more stuff, and up Japan gets more and more westernized. With the exception of, all of a sudden, let me get rid of Iyasada, and let me get rid of Perry, and that Perry. I forgot how many images I have open. When all of a sudden, the American delegation stops. It just stops coming. And Japan's like, what's happening? W where did America go? They're the ones spearheading this westernization. I mean, what are you doing, America? The year America stopped sending the legation is 1861. Now, I'm sure we all know what happened in 1861. <laughs> so... In 1861, the Confederate States of America declare independence from the United States of America, leading to the American Civil War. The American Civil War... Well, I wonder what happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the American Civil War is a huge deal in the context of the United States. That goes without saying. 
Abraham Lincoln focuses pretty much 100% of his attention on the Civil War. From 1861 to 1865, the United States government barely talks. They even, like, does any basic diplomatic relations with any other country. They can kind of get away with it because, you know, America's a hemisphere away from most other countries. Um... But for most of the world, it's like America disappeared for like four years. <laughs> but um, just America just cuts off all, to all, all talks is just dealing with this huge war. And Japan's like, huh, where did America go? The American Civil War breaking out is going to be the turning point for the Sono Joy movement in Japan. Now, let me just read my notes. In 1861, the American Civil War breaks out. The United States devotes 100% of its attention to putting down the Confederate States, and thus, the American annual legation to Japan ceased in 1861. Because the legation stopped, the westernization process in Japan began to slow down a bit, and the Sono Joy movement sought to take advantage of the United States' distraction. Now, there's another thing, beyond the fact that the um, Sono Joy movement can use the lack of westernization to push their ideas, they also use the American Civil War to point at America and say, hey, just because America has all these advanced technology doesn't mean they're any better than us, they're not superior than us, because they fight amongst themselves too. Um, what I have written down is, the American Civil War was also used by the Sono Joy movement to showcase to other Japanese that just because Westerners had better technology, that did not mean that they were some sort of superior people, because they too fought amongst themselves. So, American Civil War breaks out 1861. The Sono Joy movement gains traction until March 11, 1863, in which Emperor Kolme is like, alright, on March 11th, he gives this order called the order to expel the barbarians what it says is all right foreigners you have about a month to leave and if you're not out of here by may 11th we'll kill you hashtag white equivalency what's a white equivalency <laughs> is that a is that a normal hashtag um yeah Coleman's like get out of here in a month or we'll kill you now, the Shogun's like, whoa, 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 whoa hold on, man. Um, <laughs> I don't think we should be doing that. First of all, you're not even in power. And Coleman's like, I don't care. So the Shogun refuses to follow the order. However, that doesn't matter when most of the population, most of the civilians support the Emperor. So on May 11th, there's this, like, um... What's the example? If we're talking the Turner Diaries, it's the Day of the Rope. If we're talking World War II, it's Kristallnacht. It's the May 11th, 1863. Sucks to be white in Japan, anywhere in Japan, because everyone's dying left and right. It's the purge. Um, I should not be laughing about this. Um, to give an example, on May 11th, there was an outbreak of violence against all non-Japanese assets in the nation, and even shogunate assets were attacked. This is beginning to show that the civilians are upset with the shogun, because, you know, he's sort of, he opened the gates to the quote-unquote barbarians. Um, one of the examples of violence was the Nanamugi incident. Um, <laughs> hashtag Radix secretly hates us. Hey man, I'm mixed. This is a civil war as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, uh, one of the examples is the Nanamugi incident in which an English merchant by the name of Charles Lennox Richardson was in the town of Nanamugi. He's walking down the street. From the other side of the street comes the daimyo of Satsuma. They're walking in opposite directions, are about to pass each other. Once they pass each other, uh, the Satsuma body bodyguard just casually attacks and kills Richardson. Um, as a result of the incident, the shogun had to pay 100,000 British pounds to the United Kingdom in reparations. Which, by the way, because the shogun is a legitimate government of Japan, or at least is perceived as a legitimate government by the rest of the world, the shogun ends up having to pay the reparations to every Western country that the Sono Joy movement guys kill. <laughs> um, but, uh... But believe it or not, after May 11th, 1863, they didn't kill 100% of the white people. So Emperor Kolme is like, all right, let's get ready for round two, boys. <laughs> so in April of 1863, he gives the order to expel the uh, barbarians again. <clears throat> again. So you have Purge Part 2. Now, the biggest part about the second time the order is issued 
is uh let me move my notes hashtag good guy shogun <laughs> uh let me move my notes so i can see my paint thing now the biggest thing is choshu's bombings all right so there are two major domains we are dealing with here this in red would be the Choshu domain. The Choshu domain heavily supports the Sono Joy movement. Along with Choshu is the Satsuma uh, domain, which is about this region. Uh, depending on when you're, we're talking about, it also includes these two parts. Uh, if you remember at the beginning of the stream, I said before that my people come from Satsuma, this area. Um, oh boy, more MS Paint. Well, technically it's paint.net. But if you're wondering what Radix's family's doing during this time, my family's over here in the Satsuma domain. But Satsuma and Choshu are two heavily Sonojoi places. So Choshu, when the order to expel the, rebel uh, the barbarians is given a second time, Choshu is right near the Shimonoseki Straits. That's sort of this area. Let me check to see if you guys can see that. Yeah, that's the Shimonoseki Straits, as you can imagine. Very important place for trade, especially when the Westerners show up. Uh, <laughs> the Lord of the Choshu Domain, when the, sec when the order is given again, just does a sudden surprise attack on all Western ships in the Shimonoseki Straits. Um, all these ships happen to be United States ships, by the way. Um, Again, this is 1863. This is still right in the middle of the American Civil War. <laughs> but these American ships in Shimonoseki Straits just get bombed. Um, this results in the Battle of the Shimonoseki Straits, and the Americans eventually have to retreat. So America's like, oh no, I'm getting out of here. Um, now, ironically, the weapons used by Choshu um, were actually gifts that the United States had given to them as part of that annual legation type thing. Now... In response to this, can you hear it? Can, can you hear it just slightly in the background? God save all gracious queen! The Brits show up, and they're like, Yo, my, I heard you've been attacking Americans! And so to get revenge for the Battle of the Shimonoseki Straits, the United Kingdom comes in and just bombards Kagoshima. Kagoshima is about right here. Um... Now, if you remember, this is the Satsuma domain. <laughs> Choshu attacks American ships in the Shimonoseki Straits, so the British bomb a Satsuma port. <laughs> there, there are some lump, uh, some jumps in logic in this little incident, but uh, you get the idea. Um. In response to the Shimono Battle of the Shimonoseki Straits, the British Navy bombarded the city of Kagoshima, which was inside the Satsumo Domain. Eventually, the Shogun negotiates peace with the United Kingdom and the United States that cost the Shogun even more money in reparations. So, play by play. Emperor in Kyoto, who doesn't even technically have political power, says, kick out the foreigners. The Lord of Choshu shoots up American ships. In revenge, the British show up and bomb a Satsuma port. And to wrap it all up, the Shogunate, the actual government, <laughs> has to pay money in reparation to the British and Americans to secure peace after these these domains did that. It's a very interesting web of just hatred. <laughs> or not hate, uh, of just a few jumps in logic. Uh, let's hide the UK. We can actually hide the US. Let's go back here. Alright, now the bombardment of Kagoshima leads to even more rebellion. Uh, there, the Sono Joy rise up several times. You have the Mito Rebellion in May of 1864 until January of 1865. You have the Hamaguri Gate Rebellion on August 20th, 1864. And then you have the first Choshu ex Expedition in September to November 1864. So Choshu is being a bad boy again. <laughs> uh, Choshu... Let me color Choshu again. Choshu in 1864 
rebels against the Shogunate. They sort of want the Emperor to be restored. Um, this causes the Shogun, Shogun Tokugawa Iemochi. So we're on a new Shogun now. Let me show you guys that new Shogun. Iemochi. There we go. Iemochi. All the Shoguns kind of look the same. So <laughs> really, you get an idea of one of them. You get an idea of most of them. But Iemochi, um, he himself goes down to Choshu. Uh, let me get my colors. The Shogun goes down to Choshu, Choshu, um, and then he fights the rebels. Now, during this time, this is still 1864, mind you, still during the Civil War, but the United States... That's the wrong layer, isn't it? Not the entirety of the Kanto region goes over to... Uh, the United States... The United Kingdom France ah. Come to think about it, I oh did I move the actual ground? Hold up. France You know, just bear with me. This is a fairly large alliance of countries. France. And last but not least, the Netherlands. I say last but not least, but let's be honest. I keep moving the ground itself. Hold up. Typical French. And the Nether in the Netherlands. Well, the Shogun is punishing Choshu. France, the United Kingdom, United States, still in the Civil War, and the Netherlands all just launched what is called the Shimonoseki Campaign because they want to restore Western influence over the Shimonoseki Straits. So once again, <laughs> this massive alliance just goes and takes back the Shimonoseki Straits. Um, Choshu ultimately falls. They actually replace the Choshu government with a... Um, the boys are back in town. That's exactly right. Um, I'm not going to be able to get rid of this line, am I? Oh, no. You know where the Dutch and British and French are. I just need to control Z up until I get rid of that line. I should have thought about that beforehand. There we go. Um... So Choshu Falls, they replace the government. I don't think the Japanese like the Netherlands as much anymore. No, no, they don't. Um, but Choshu Falls, they replace the government with a government that's pro-Tokugawa, even though the people of Choshu still hate the Tokugawa government. Um, and after the fall of Choshu, the Sono Joy movement kind of simmers down because, you know, the first Choshu ex expedition, as it's called, ends up being like what they thought was their last stand their last stand. So there's a period of silence. Emperor Kolme and the Sono Joy leadership begin a period of silence. Nevertheless, it's clear that the Shogun has had perceived as having lost his right to rule. Most daimyo at this point end up ignoring orders from Edo. So now the local rulers just stop looking at the Tokugawa government as their government. That's going to cause a problem. However, for the most part, for now, the first wave of Sono Joy um, Tokugawa rivalry ends. So fast forward some years. Some years, or is it just one year? <laughs> Let me check. I don't have a date, but I think it's one year. So, But fast forward a while, and now we have the Franco-British rivalry. Let me just read what I have here, because I think I'm a better writer than a speaker. Throughout much of their history, the French and the English have been bitter rivals. In the 1500s, this rivalry came in the form of the Hundred Years' War. In the 1700s, this rivalry came in the form of their struggles for America. During this time, France and the United Kingdom were imperial rivals who sought to colonize or obtain the most influence throughout the entire world in order to trump the other. When it came to Japan, it was clear to both France and the United Kingdom that a civil war was bound to break out, and the two countries wanted to have a winning team on their side. Ultimately, France decided to support the Shogunate. 
while the United Kingdom supported the Imperial faction. So now, Britain's like, yo, Japan, sorry about, well, yo, Emperor, more like, yo, Emperor, yo, Sono Joy movement, sorry about that time I sort of, uh, you know, uh, let me check my OBS to check if I'm showing the right... Yeah, okay. I almost had a panic attack. Sorry about that time I bombarded Kagoshima. And that time I invaded Shimonoseki Straits. But you know what? I think you, Mr. Emperor dude, you should rule this Japan place, right? Am I right? I mean, if there's anything we British know, it's that we must give our glory to the crown, eh? <laughs> Isn't it? But, um... <laughs> Uh, France, on the meanwhile, is like... Oh, we oui, 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 sacré bleu! Oui, Tokugawa, I see the United Kingdom is trying to back the... the Emperor! Oui, oui, would you like some of our baguettes and maybe... Put down the Emperor, and so Japan will be pro French. That's their diplomatic dialogue. By the way, I should note, as I talked about earlier, about how Japan really liked Dutch culture, most translations, most conversation, it was typically through Dutch. <laughs> so, Dutch was usually the language Japan used to communicate with any European or American powers. Um... <coughs> So, I think this might be a little racist or something. For what, the French? <laughs> what are they going to do? Cry. Um, back here, let's get rid of Iemochi. Um, actually, let's keep Iemochi. Let's move Iemochi, Iemochi over here. And Kome over here, because they're the two big cheese at this time. The Imperial faction and the Shogun faction. The United Kingdom helps to modernize the army and navy of the Satsuma Domain through the help of the British Thomas Blake Glover, who sold warships and modern weaponry. Now, an important dude from the British is Harry Smith Parks, this white dude over here. British diplomat Harry Smith Parks gave diplomatic support to the idea of a unified Japan under a proper and formal imperial government. A government. So Parks pretty much leads the charge in forming this imperial British alliance. Uh, Saigo, uh, it's not, uh, Satsuma diplomat Saigo Takamori, who is hidden by Iemochi right now. Saigo, Ta Saigo Takamori is kind of considered like the Thomas Jefferson of Japan. Um, if Thomas Jefferson became a traitor about two years after America won independence. But um, Saigo Takamori and Ito Hirobumi are considered like the main founders of Japan, or at least modern Japan. But Saigo Takamori of Satsuma um, and Choshu diplomat Ito Hirobumi become close allies to the British diplomat Ernest Mason Sato. So all in all, the Emperor and the Brits are having fun. Meanwhile... What's his name? Iomochi. France gives support to the Shogun. And here are the... Well, I'll show them later. The Shogun knew that it needed to reassert its power and that more wars were coming. Emperor Napoleon III of France sent his best forces to Japan to train the Shogun and army. So the French actually had pretty elite forces at this time. And here are the French troops that were sent to Japan to help train the Japanese. Um, these French officers were, like, actually pretty much the best of the best. They have a lot of experience fighting the Russians in the Crimean War. Uh, if you don't know, the Crimean War was a war fought about ten years before this, where um, Russia and the Ottoman Empire went to war and France supported the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> they look French. Dear God, yes, they do. Um, but they also fought against Austria in the Second Italian War of Independence. Uh, if you don't know, Italy fought several wars of independence against Austria, and France largely supported the Italians, sometimes. But these French troops were battle-hardened, they were experienced, they were the best France had to offer. Um, with their help, the Tokugawa shogunate made a unit called the Denshutai, which was supposedly their elite unit. This is the only time I'm going to mention the Denshutai, because they don't really make a difference. <laughs> um... The Shinsengumi do, but we'll get to the Shinsengumi later. Um, 
a Frenchman by the name of Léonce Verny, Ver, I'm not good with French names by the way, Léonce Verny, provided weapons and vessels that modernized the Shogunate army and made the Shogunate navy the strongest navy in Asia. Just period. This Shogun navy was... Nothing could beat it until later. Now, one thing that could beat the Shogunate navy would be what was called an ironclad, a ship that recently made its debut in the American Civil War. Um, it started with a scuffle between... <coughs> During the American Civil War, both sides were experimenting with the idea of putting iron, like iron plating on your ships, called ironclads. Um, the Confederacy, I believe, made the first one. They found uh, an old Union ship called the Merrimack, and they just stuck iron plates on it and renamed it to the CSS Virginia. Um, it went over into Hampton Roads, I believe. It went over to some area, and the Union created their own ironclad. And the ironclads fought for like two hours, but their um, cannonballs just bounced off each other's hulls. So, so the ironclads were revolutionary. After the after the uh, Virginia uh, Monitor battle. Um, in the Civil War, both sides began to develop ironclads, and all these other countries were like, man, if only I had an ironclad. So, around this time, the CSS Stonewall, named after Stonewall Jackson, was a Confederate ironclad that was captured by the Union at this time. The Shogunate forces realized that they had the best navy in Asia, the only thing that could stop them was an ironclad, and they thought, well, you can't stop us if we actually have an ironclad. So the Shogunate ask America... I remember the ironclads, were you there? The Shogunate asked the United States, Hey, you have that old CSS... Well, not old, there was a new invention. You have that CSS Stonewall captured recently. You want to you wanna give it over to the Shogunate? We're trying to keep Japan foreigner-friendly. And America... And the United States is like... Uh, I'll get around to it. So Japan, uh, not, uh, the United States drags its feet, and the CSS Stonewall will take a long time before they finally give it to Japan. Um, let's see. Shogunate forces place the Shogunate placed an order for the CSS Stonewall, a Confederate States of America warship that had been captured by the United States. Um, however, America did not go around to completing the order. So, as you can see, both the Imperial Faction and the Shogunate Faction are getting support from Europe. Now, the second Choshu Expedition takes place. In Choshu, the complacent government that was put in place after the first Choshu Expedition was overthrown by a pro sono joi coup. The Shogunate... So, basically, <laughs> Choshu just won't chill goes back to rebelling, overthrows its installed government, and goes back to, you know, revere the Emperor, expel the barbarians. And the Shogun is like, can you chill, man? <laughs> so the Shogun announces that, hey, we're going to send troops to, to Choshu. We're going to put them down a second time. Hey, you know, it's it's all going to be good. While, while they announce that, Choshu makes a secret alliance with the Satsuma Domain. Basically, if the, if the Shogunate show up in Choshu, Satsuma forces are going to be present. So, Shogunate forces march on over to Choshu, and they get surprised. Uh, they, they, to their surprise, there are a lot more forces than they, they expected because Satsuma forces are there. Um, in 1866, the Satsuma-Choshu alliance defeats the Shogunate forces in battle. The defeat of the Shogun was another hit to the Shogun's perceived right to rule. Now, the Shogun just lost a major battle against the Choshu Satsuma forces. This this is this threatens to just throw Japan into turmoil. It threatens to break out into civil war. But we have to take a little pause because uh, Shogun Iemochi and Emperor Komei, pretty much at the same exact time, the leaders of the two factions. They just freaking die. <laughs> the dudes just die. So both sides are like, all right, before we escalate this into a full-scale war, let's take a moment to chill and, like, you know, get ready our leaders, you know, introduce ourselves to our leaders and have them get caught up on the thing. 
For, J for the Imperial faction, a young man by the name of Meiji shows up. Now, he's about 20 in this image. Around this time, he's actually 16. So, Kolmei's son, the 16-year-old Meiji, at this time he's known as Mutsuhito. Um, with Japanese emperors, they have a name that they're called when they're born and when they live. But once they die, they go by a different name. His name when he was alive was Mutsuhito, but after he died, he's known as Meiji. <coughs> um, he all Japanese emperors end with Hito. Uh, you have Mutsuhito, his son will be Yoshihito, I believe, and his son will be, and then Yoshi, Yoshihito's son would be Hirohito, and then his son's Akihito. But, um, we'll be calling him Meiji. Um, that's weird. What's weird? I mean, I said a lot of weird things. The two leaders die at the same time. A 16-year-old dude takes the throne. There are two names for Japanese emperors. <laughs> um, so... He steps up to the throne of the Imperial faction. Meanwhile, Tokugawa Yoshinobu becomes the Shogun. Let me get a drink. Hmm. So first, let's talk about uh, Sh Yoshinobu. Yoshinobu, Tokugawa, Shogun Tokugawa Yoshinobu was... um. He's a veteran of both the first and second Choshu expeditions, but he's kind of, he kind of doesn't have a spine, to be honest. He kind of doesn't want to be a leader. He's just ascended to the throne. So he's like, oh man, I guess I'm, I guess I'm in this situation now. No, no, the 16-year-old thing is pretty normal. The two names thing. I uh, gotcha. Like, for example, I think the Emperor Americans know the best is Hirohito, the Emperor during World War II. Nobody calls him Hirohito in Japan. They call him Showa. Uh, they called him Hirohito when he was alive, but well, really they called him His Imperial Majesty. But you know, it's very rare. You're not on first name basis with the emperor. Um, but today, if you were if you were to call him Hirohito in Japan today, it would be seen as disrespectful. Uh, you should call him Showa. So where was I? Yeah, Yoshinobu kind of doesn't want to be here. Meiji is like, all right, I am in the perfect place to push um, to become emperor. Meiji's a bit different from his father in that he's a lot more hardcore with wanting to get power back. But he's also less xenophobic than his father. He's more of, he's more revere the emperor as opposed to expel the barbarians, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. Um, but, uh, yeah. So... They have this little period of peace, and in 1867, <laughs> Emperor Meiji writes the order to give permission to Choshu and Satsuma to attack Shogun Yoshinobu and just kill him for his treachery for not following the leadership of his emperor. However, before he can give them the order to just go and kill the dude, um, Yoshinobu pulls a, um, pulls a little meme and says, You know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna resign. I'm just gonna step down. I don't want to be here. You don't want to be here. No one wants me here. I'm just gonna quit. Um, so he says, um, in 1867, Emperor Meiji was about to secretly give the order for Choshu and Satsuma to attack the shogunate and kill Shogun Yoshinobu for his treachery. However, before that act was passed, Shogun Yoshinobu unexpectedly resigned his power and powers to Emperor Meiji and agreed to become an instrument to carry out imperial orders on the condition that Shogun Yoshinobu would Yoshinobu Shogun Yoshinobu would still keep his status and illusion of power. Basically, Yoshinobu saying, "I'll resign." <coughs> but what I mean by resign is I'm still the shogun. It's just I won't make any decisions for myself. The emperor just tells me what to do and I'll do it. That's the compromise that he proposes. You know, technically he's still in power, but the emperor will be telling him what to do. However, for the, the Imperial faction, the idea that the Tokugawa name would still have power and still be the Shogun was intolerable. Um, so, Choshu and Satsuma, on January 3rd, 1868, send their forces and occupy Kyoto, the place where the Emperor lives. Now, when I say occupy Kyoto, it sounds like they're like holding the Emperor prisoner. That's not what it was. Te again, technically, this whole country is under the Tokugawa control. So, by occupy Kyoto, I mean take it from Tokugawa control. Um, so, they occupy Kyoto. 
So, which gives the Emperor more autonomy. So January 3rd, 1868 is generally recognized as the beginning of the Boshin War. Um, they The Sonsaman Choshu forces meet with Emperor Meiji. Am I showing the map or am I showing the... Yeah, wrong thing. Uh, there, that little red I had in Kyoto, that's the new occupied Sonojoi Imperial Faction Territory. <clears throat> Uh, on January 3rd, 1868, Satsuma and Choshu forces occupied Kyoto and met with Emperor Meiji in solidarity with his two supportive domains. Emperor Meiji officially declared his restoration to political power and the beginning of what was called the Meiji Restoration. Uh, Saigo Takamori, uh, this dude, uh, Takamori, 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 this, uh, let me get rid of this, Takamori. Saigo Takamori goes as far as to suggest that they should abolish the title of Shogun. This marks the beginning of the Boshin War and leads to the establishment. With Meiji, with the Meiji Restoration, Meiji declares that the Tokugawa Shogunate is gone and he is establishing a new country with the official name of Dai Nippon Teikoku, the Greater Japanese Empire, translated literally, or in English we mostly hear it called the Empire of Japan. So he declares the Empire of Japan, which as of right now is Kyoto, Joshu, and Satsuma. Um, so. Let's go back here. Yoshinobu is like, oh, I see you're making a new country. That's cool. Um, I agree. Sure, let's do this. Um, <laughs> he's like, sure, go ahead and make your empire. That's fine. I'll step down. However... <laughs> The Japanese people still don't like the Tokugawa government, still don't like Yoshinobu. So in Edo, <laughs> his own home, um, the citizens just begin rioting. They set fire, there's arsons everywhere, they throw rocks and stuff, they try to burn down the Tokugawa palace in Edo. So Yoshinobu's like, oh, wait a minute, if you make this empire, what's going to happen to me? You're not going to just throw me out to the peasants and have me killed, are you? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, man, please. All right. Uh, let's just go back to the status quo. Stop declaring your creation of a Japanese empire. And uh, we, we, can, we can figure this out, man. Okay, man, that ain't cool. I, I, I gotta go to war with you. I gotta stop you. I gotta get my house back in order. I didn't want to be here, but if I want to live, I kind of have to do something. And so, um, let me read out what I have written out. Uh, however, Japanese people who supported the Imperial faction and were anti-shogun in Edo began a series of arsons around Edo, including an attack on the Tokugawa Palace. Shogun Yoshinobu pleaded with the Imperial faction in Kyoto to take back their declaration of the Meiji Restoration. Obviously, the Imperial faction rejected the shogun's request. Finally, on January 24, 1868, Shogun Yoshinobu gathered his forces and prepared to launch an attack on Kyoto to push back the Choshu and Satsuma forces. Um, I have a little note here about why this war is called the Boshin War. <clears throat> the Boshin War was named after the name of the year on the second Sekigenary cycle from the Chinese calendar. And other names of the war included the Boshin Civil War, the Japanese Civil War, or the Japanese Revolution. It's just you see Boshin War used most of the time in academia. So now the war is in full swing. Uh... Let's go here. Let's go to the map. So the Tokugawa forces march over to Kyoto like, yo! Uh, I guess I can put that in a more technical way. Um, Yoshinobu's forces, the Shogun forces, are about 15,000 troops who have been trained by the French. Most of the army contains samurai and the Shinsengumi. Now the samurai are still using pretty much katana. Some of them have muskets, yes, but for the most part they're straight up samurai. They're not western foot soldiers. So most of them are samurai, the rest are the Shinsengumi. Now, it took a lot of work to try to find a photograph of the Shinsengumi. The Shinsengumi literally means new unit, but basically during the Choshu expeditions 
um, the Tokugawa shogunate established the Shinsengumi, which were essentially the Tokugawa's secret police. They were almost sort of the predecessor to the Yoitip... Yoitipit... Oh, yeah, Yo Shop of Commander X 2018. Yes, describing the dramatic battle of Toba Fushimi. But, um... The Shinsengumi are, again, the secret police, sort of the Gestapo of the Tokugawa forces. They were used to put down people in the Choshu, Choshu expeditions. And now, really, the Shinsengumi are the elite forces. Out of all the fighting forces in this entire war, the Shinsengumi are the most trained, the most skilled, frankly, the most scary, because they, you know, torture people and, you know, kill your whole family after they kill you. Um, but yeah, another thing is, it was very hard to find a photograph of the Shinsengumi because there's a certain anime called Gintama. <laughs> Where some of the main characters are Shinsengumi. Um, Gintama is sort of this mix of sci-fi and history. A lot of the Shinsengumi characters in the Boshin War show up in Gintama. But, um, yeah. If you look up Shinsengumi, you're going to see a lot of anime characters. Japan likes to turn their history into anime, especially the samurai era. So there are quite a few, not necessarily anime, but anime-type games. Like... For every picture I've shown you of a photograph of someone, I could have shown you this weird anime-fied version of them where they look like Assassin's Creed style with over-the-top uniforms from some sort of mobile game <laughs> a Japanese company made. Um, certainly Saigo Takamori, Emperor Kolme, Emperor Meiji, those types of people. Even Harry, uh, Harry Smith Parks. Uh... The dude with the beard, he has an anime version. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's very interesting who they decide to anime and who they decide to not. Um, so, Yoshinobu's forces, 15,000 Muslim samurai, but also had the Shinsengumi. Um, the Imperial forces, the Choshu Satsuma forces, were outnumbered 3 to 1. However... They were armed with Armstrong howitzers and Gatling guns from Great Britain. <laughs> so, you essentially have this huge army of samurai, a smaller amount of dudes, but the small amount of dudes have Gatling guns. <laughs> so, it's a very interesting type deal. So, the battle goes on for about two... D this battle is called the Battle of Toba Fushimi. The Tokugawa shogun dudes are trying to push through the south gate of Kyoto to get in. The battle lasts for about two days. On day two, Prince Yoshiaki uh, Ninnai Jinomiya. Gatling guns are better than samurai. Yes, as, you, as you'll see. On the second day of fighting, uh, Prince Yoshiaki, Yoshiaki Ninnai Jinomiya of the Imperial family, he comes out of the city and just takes leadership of the Choshu and Satsuma forces and just beats the crap out of the Shogun with, you know, Gatling guns. Um... And as as the shogun, no, as the, as the empire, as the uh, imperial faction becomes gets more and more of the upper hand, just one by one, all these domains begin to send forces to Kyoto to support the emperor. And before you know it, half the country is part of the Japanese Empire. So now we essentially have a situation where we have a country divided by north and south in the 1860s fighting each other with muskets and gatling guns <laughs> in a civil war. Does that sound familiar? So, let's see. Uh... Uh, the forces are joined by other domains who begin to one by one rebel against the shogunate and back the emperor. Ultimately, the battle ends in a decisive imperial victory. So by February 7th, uh, the shogun army begins to pull back. They're like, oh man, that sucked, run away! So the shogun army is on a retreat path back towards Edo. Which, uh... Let's see if I can do this without screwing anything up. Ah. So, the Shogun forces are trying to run away back to Edo. Here. At the same time, 
the Shogun himself gets on a boat and just leaves to go to Edo. He gets there before the army does. In fact, the army kind of doesn't get there because the Imperial forces follow them. So the, the Shogun essentially abandons his troops as they retreat. In fact, there's even a picture of it. Um... Where is it? Yoshinobu is escaping. Yeah, there's this nice dramatic woodblock print <laughs> of Yoshinobu just sailing away on his boats. You see in the background the fires <laughs> of his troops just dying. And he was like, oh man, this didn't go to plan. <laughs> um, I also have a, uh, a painting Mount Fuji, Mount Fuji, Mount Fuji. Yeah, here. These are Shogun forces on their retreat. This was painted by uh, one of the French advisors who was part of the Shogun army. The French advisor, you know, the army is just kind of straggling, trying to retreat north, and this is them stopping by Mount Fuji. So the French do decide to paint them just chilling for a little bit as they're running for their lives, essentially. <laughs> um... On February 7th, 1868, the shogunate forces withdrew from Kyoto. While the shogunate army was retreating, Shogun Yoshinobu himself got on a boat from Osaka straight to Edo, leaving his troops behind to try to make their way to Edo on foot while holding off advancing imperial forces. Uh, there's also a minor note that will become more important later. Again, the shogun navy is incredible. So, where's Enomoto Takeaki? So, the imperial Japanese navy tries to take on the Shogun Navy, and the Shogun Navy crushes the Imperial Japanese Navy. This is the first, and I think only, Shogun victory in the entire war, um, is through their Navy. Uh, the Admiral of the Satsuma, not Satsuma, uh, Shogun Navy is this dude named Enomoto Takeaki. He will become important very later on. Um, the Satsuma Navy under Akatsuka Genroku fought the Shogunate Navy under Enomoto Takeaki, which led to one of the few Shogunate victories in the war, though it was n of no importance beyond naval supremacy. Alright, now we have the what I call the Hyogo, the Hyogo Circus. Um, okay, so Japan's in Civil War... Now the European and Americans have to figure out what to do. Um, as the Boshin War broke out, the Western nations met in Hyogo, which is today Kobe, which is in Choshu. The Western nations came to the consensus that they would maintain recognition of the shogunate as the legitimate government of Japan. This gave Shogun Yoshinobu hope that nations like France would intervene in the war to put down the imperial faction. However, later on, members of the Imperial faction walked into the conference room and met with the Western nations in Hyogo, and informed them that the shogunate government has been abolished. After affirming that all previous treaties would be maintained and that foreigners would be protected, the world decided to recognize the Imperial government over Japan rather than the shogun. Though a diplomatic victory, the compromise showed that Emperor Meiji was trying to forge a future where Japan cooperated with the rest of the world on its own terms, rather than a world where Japan continued to be isolationist. With this compromise, the Sono Joy movement died. So, where, where is he? Meiji, 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 Meiji. So Meiji pretty much walks in and says, all right, world, we're the legitimate government of Japan now, but we will make sure Japan continues to westernize just on a rate that we can control better. So when the emperor says, we're okay with foreigners here, we're okay with controlled westernization, the Sono Joy movement is pretty much dead now. The idea that you need to kick out all foreigners and return to isolation. Uh, it's evolved into this new idea that Meiji sees. Meiji's envisioning an idea where Japan gets respected by the rest of the world, where it's a very interesting thing. Meiji comes to the conclusion that the rest of the world is pretty much stepping on Japan because Japan is technologically inefficient. It's behind the rest of the world. But Meiji believes that if Japan can westernize and become as technologically advanced as the rest of the world and began making its own 
colonies and colonizing places and expanding an empire, then the rest of the world would likely come to respect Japan as a country. And Japan would be welcomed as part of the, you know, overlords of the world, you know, the Europeans and Americans. Even as early as this period, when Japan, when the Empire of Japan only controls about half the country, you see signs that Japan is considering the idea that it needs to not only unify Japan, but to expand out beyond Japan and to create a much larger empire. It's very interesting. Um, <laughs> now, even though Meiji promised that foreigners would be protected under imperial super, uh, surveillance, there are some pro-imperial pro, pro samurai who actually aren't formally affiliated with the imperial faction. They casually kill 11 French sailors <laughs> um, later on, and then they attack Harry Smith Parks, the British dude um, who was allying Britain with Japan. Um, Nevertheless, Parks manages to meet with the Western powers in Hyogo, and he helps create the Neutrality Agreement, in which everyone agrees that nobody is going to directly intervene in the Boshin War. They're going to let Japan fight this war for themselves. So Parks <laughs> continuing to side with Japan even after some samurai attacked <laughs> in the name of the Emperor, no less. Meanwhile, in Edo, um, so... <laughs> Parks shows just how well the British Imperial Alliance is going on. In Edo, Shogun Yoshinobu is meeting with his French ambassador, Leon Roche, uh, to try to find a way to stop the Imperial advances. Roche suggests that they just surrender all the land between um, Kyoto and Edo and just prepare a defense at the gates of Edo. But Yoshinobu's like, no, we need to go out and attack. We need to go on the offensive. And Roche just gets frustrated and quits so the british alliance with the emperor with the british alliance with the japanese empire is a lot stronger than the french alliance with the japanese shogunate now takamori uh this dude saigo takamori takes the charge and leads the imperial faction as it continues uh north to edo where's the tokugawa flag there it is. So, the Tokugawa forces are moving north. Takamori is following close behind, just beating the crap out of them. And while he's doing that, the Japanese Empire is steadily expanding. And about these two. So the Empire is continuing to have its way. Um, Satsuma leader Saigo Takamori led the Imperial forces to the north and to the east, winning several battles against the Shogunate's struggling army. By May of 1868, Takamori had Edo itself surrounded. A Shogunate army officer negotiated the unconditional surrender of Edo to Takamori. Even as the shogunate was done for and Edo was captured, some shogunate forces continued a resistance until they were finally defeated in the Battle of Ueno on July 4th, 1868. With that, um, the shogunate dies. That's the wrong layer. And Japan has expanded. So the shogunate's dead. What next? Well... The Northern Alliance is what happens next. So, despite the collapse of the Shogun government, many of the Northern Domains still support the Shogun and oppose the Empire. Shogunate Naval Admiral Enomoto Takeaki, if you remember him, he's the naval officer who, um, who is at the head of the Shogun Navy. Uh, Enomoto Takeaki fled with his superior navy to the north, hoping to stage a counterattack against the Empire with the help of his French advisors. In a diplomatic move, Enomoto saw the Northern Domains unite to form a new country called the Northern Alliance. So let's mark this Northern Alliance on a map. Let's go with a... Whoa, not you. Let's give it a nice sort of green. 
So at this point, the Northern Alliance declares independence from Japan. These are all the domains that supported. Am I going to be able to recolor these when the time comes? Not really, but whatever. So the Northern Alliance, uh, we have their flag here. It's just, <laughs> it's just a star. The Northern Alliance opposes Japan, blah, blah, blah. The Northern Alliance is armed with 50,000 troops plus Takayaki's naval force. They also have some of the remains of the Shinsengumi. Now, the ambitious and opportunistic Prince Kitashira, Kitashirakawa Yoshihisa. Let me pull him up. Oh, I didn't. Oh, I didn't show on the map. Green. This greenish thing is the Northern Alliance. And that little star is their flag. Japan is quite literally divided in half. Um, Takeaki. I don't know if I showed Edo being captured, but you see how the empire has expanded in red. Oh, what did I just do? Okay. Um, this dude, a prince of the royal family, or the imperial family, Prince Kitashirakawa Yoshihisa of the imperial family himself, he heads north to the Northern Alliance with some hand-picked forces. However, it's revealed that these forces are actually Shogun loyalists and that Prince Kitashirakawa has defected to the Northern Alliance, declaring that he is now Emperor Tobu of the Northern Alliance. The Northern Alliance welcomes Emperor Tobu as their leader to oppose Emperor Meiji. So now, even though the Shogun is gone, Emperor Meiji has to fight his own relative who now declares himself Emperor Tobu in the north with Shogun loyalists. Um, now it should be known that the Northern Alliance has very little modern weaponry. Um, most of their forces were old style samurai. They possess a small amount of French rifles that were given to them by a German uh, weapons merchant named Henry Schnell, but besides that, they got swords. Um, so almost immediately, the, Imper the Japanese Empire invades the Northern Alliance. Um, in May of 1868, Imperial forces attacked the Northern Alliance at the bloody Battle of Hokuetsu. Uh, though the Empire took heavy casualties, the Northern Alliance forces had to fall back. The Empire continued to pursue them to the Battle of Bonari Pass, where the Empire crushed a majority of what Shinsengumi remained. The defeat of the Shinsengumi opened up a path to the Northern Alliance's last foothold of Aizu Castle. The Battle of Aizu began as the Empire continued to crush the Northern Alliance. So Aizu's about over... Here, so let's let me make sure I'm showing the right screen. Yes. So the empire pushes north. Uh, no, nah, they didn't take the entire, but push-ups here. At some point, the Shin Sengumi is all that lies between um, them and Aizu Castle. But eventually, Japan begins to besiege Aizu Castle, which is sort of like their last stronghold. So, Takeaki is going to take some of his guys and just flee over to Hakodate because he knows that the rest of Honshu, the rest of this main area of Japan, is done for. So he wants to go to Hokkaido and try to establish the last line of defense. Uh, let's see. On October 12th, the Northern Alliance crumbled and Enomoto Takeaki used his navy to ferry himself and their remaining forces from Sendai to Hokkaido. Um, Hokkaido is the big island at the top. Um, all that remained of the pro-shogunate faction was Takeaki's fleet, 1,000 ex-shogun forces under General Otori Keisuke, a small remainder of the Shinsengumi under Hichikata Toshizo, four French advisors, and a civilian corps called the Guerrilla Corps under Hitomi Katsutaro. To cover their retreat, the remainder of the Northern Alliance left behind the Byakotai, or White Tiger Corps. So, that faction pretty much abandons uh, that part of Japan. They leave these guys, the Byakotai, or White Tiger Corps. They're pretty much told to fight and die at Aizu, or Aizuchi, what's it called? Aizu. 
Aizu, yeah. While everyone else flees to Hokkaido. The thing about the White Tiger Corps is that they're all teenagers. This is quite literally a child army, a children's army. They leave behind the kids to die <laughs> so they can cover their escape. On October 26th, Emperor Meiji himself is brought to Tokyo. And this... Uh, this is a drawing of Meiji. He's in the palisade going to Edo. Did I say Tokyo? I meant Edo. Emperor Meiji was brought to Edo, where he took Tokugawa Palace and renamed it to the Imperial Palace. And then he made Edo the new capital of the Japanese Empire and renamed it to Tokyo. As Edo became Tokyo and the Empire was on the verge of victory, so, so Japan's forming, Edo's become Tokyo, everyone's celebrating in the Japanese Empire. As that's happening, the White Tiger Corps, the teenage army left to cover the Shogunist retreat, uh, they commit seppuku because, you know, there are about like a small handful of them left to fight the Imperial Army. They commit seppuku, ending the Battle of Aizu, and ending the last soldiers of the Northern Alliance. So the Northern Alliance is kaput. Get out of here. And the Empire reigns supreme on Honshu. So all that's left is Hokkaido. So. Enomoto Takeaki. Why do I still have Takamori out here? Enomoto Takeaki. He arrives in Hokkaido with the remainder of the shogunate forces and lands in Hokkaido. He and his French advisors immediately set about declaring Hokkaido's independence as the Republic of Ezo. So let's go back to the map. We'll use a good blue. The Republic of Ezo is declared. There's their flag over by their capital of Hakodate. Um, it has a constitution that's heavily based off the United States Constitution. The Republic of Ezo was the first republic to ever exist in Japan. After the elections, Enomoto Takeaki wins by a landslide and becomes the first president of the Republic of Ezo. I can't imagine that lasts very long. Oh, yeah, <laughs> to be sure. Um, he makes the capital Hakodate because Hakodate is where several foreign delegations are. There are embassies in Hakodate, specifically the American, Russian, and French embassies. Uh, Ezo tries to gain recognition from these countries, but the foreign countries refuse to recognize Ezo. Partly because of the neutrality, the neutrality agreement that uh, Parks made earlier on. So Takeaki is like, this isn't going to work. Takeaki is just trying to compromise as much as he can. He goes to the Empire, and he gives. He says that Ezo will return to Japan on the condition that Shogun Yoshinobu gets put in charge over Ezo. So it's pretty much like think if. In the American Civil War, what if the Union beat the crap out of every territory of the Confederacy except for, like, Texas? And then Texas is like, okay, we'll become a state in the Union if you allow Jefferson Davis to be our governor. That sort of deal. Um, but the Empire is like, no, we can just take you anyway. What are you talking about, man? So Takiyaki is like, we're going to have to fight. So in, order, in, in preparation to defend Hokkaido... Um, the islands divided into sections of responsibility and fortified. Uh, the former shogunate general, Otori Keisuke, becomes the commander-in-chief of the Ezo military. Uh, French advisor Jules Brunet was made his second in command. Uh, all the other French advisors served as brigadier commanders, while all the other Japanese people served under their command. Um, so it's a very interesting command structure. You have the president, and then you have the commander-in-chief, who's Japanese, his second in command, who is French, the entire officer corps is French, and then everyone else are Japanese, the, ground, the main ground soldiers. A very interesting military structure that's there. And of course, the language they use to communicate is Dutch. 
Um, so on March 20th, eight, so Ezo is pretty confident that they can at least defend themselves navally because, again, they have the best navy in Asia. The only thing that can defeat them would be an ironclad. On March 20th, the Imperial Japanese Navy arrives near Miyako, which is basically near Hakodate, where the flag is. Um, and they're preparing to launch an attack on Hokkaido. Now, remember what I said about the only thing that could stop the Shogun Navy was an Iron Clan? Remember when the Tokugawa Shogunate tried to order the CSS Stonewall from the United States? And America was sort of lazy about it? Well, America has finally gotten around to giving the CSS Stonewall to Japan. However, if you remember, after the Hyogo Conference, America recognizes the Japanese Empire as Japan now, and not the, sh the Shogun forces. So, the, the very first ship of the Imperial Japanese Navy is the former Confederate ship known as the CSS Stonewall. <laughs> it's an ironclad, the very tool the Empire needs to take out the Shogunate Army, uh, the Navy. Now, they rename it to the Kotetsu. Um, so whenever I say Kotetsu, we're talking about a former Confederate ship that was named after Stonewall Jackson fighting here in the middle of East Asia <laughs> in a Japanese Civil War. What a weird world this is. Um, so the bay, the Ezo, sees the Japanese Navy approach with an ironclad. And they're like, oh no, what are we going to do? Hijitaka Toshizo the commander of what is left of the Shinsengumi, the elite forces, um, the elite forces are like, alright, there is only like a hundred of us left. We're not going to do good in any con conventional battle situation. Let's plan a heist to steal the stone wall. <laughs> so, President Chatayaki is like, that idea is so crazy. But for one, you can't do anything more than that. You're not going to be useful in a battle situation. There's so few of you left because you've been mowed down across Japan these this past year. But that just might be crazy to work. So the Shinsengumi decide to do this freaking spy movie type heist of the Stonewall. Now, the Shinsengumi infiltrate the ship. They try to steal the ship. But then the ship just happens to have an engine failure. They get exposed with the bad weather as well. <laughs> and they just stick a Gatling gun on the deck and mow down most of the remaining Shinsengumi trying to steal the ship. So the heist of the, of the, of the stone wall goes horribly wrong for the Shinsengumi. Um, very few managed to get back to Hakodate. So, in April, the Imperial Japanese Navy finally confronts the Shogunate Navy, and because they have their ironclads, Takiaki's Navy, the only thing really holding back Ezo from the rest of Japan, gets completely defeated in the Battle of Hakodate Bay. With the Shogunate Navy wiped out, the Battle of Hakodate begins when 7,000 Japanese Imperial forces are deployed in the Battle of Hakodate. And I have a picture of it over here. Not that one. Not that one. Over here somewhere. Uh, yeah. You have a little picture of the Battle of Hakodate. Um, now, so Ezo's being invaded. France sees that Ezo's being invaded. So it sends its navy under the command of Crimean war veteran Abel Nicolas Bergras du, du Petit Tours. I can't pronounce French names, but he has a very long French name. Uh, they send their best admiral to Ezo. Now first, Ezo's like, are they trying to support us? Are they trying to help us? No, they're here to evacuate the French advisors. <laughs> like, so the French advisors, the officer corps of the entire Ezo army, might I add, just get onto a boat and just leave. Which leaves Ezo going, aw man. Now the Japanese Empire asks that France 
tries the advisors for crimes of violating the neutrality agreement. But France is like, yeah, sure, I'm definitely going to do that. Um, instead, the French advisors return to France. The population of France loves them, and they're hailed as like national heroes. They do not receive any sort of punishment for their involvement in the Boshin War. So... The Battle of Hakodate is continuing, and Enomoto Takeaki is like, we have to fight to the death. However, his chief of his commander in chief, General Keisuke, convinces him to finally surrender. He tells him that to live through defeat is the more courageous way to live life. And so Takeaki is like, okay, fine. On May 18th, 1869, the Republic of Ezo surrenders to the Japanese Empire, and on June 27th, Ezo ceased to exist as Hokkaido is formally incorporated into the Japanese Empire, thereby bringing an end to the Boshin War. So let's get rid of that Ezo flag. Boom. And with that, well, would you look at that? We have the Empire of Japan all in one piece. So that wraps up this story for today. How long have we been going? I feel two hours. That's well, actually we haven't gone. I thought this was going to be a really long one, but it was average. Um, any thoughts you guys have? Any closing remarks? Um, the Japanese Empire. Now, it's important to know that Saigo Takamori was a samurai. Choshu and Satsuma were very much samurai places. The samurai, at least traditional samurai, really valued the emperor's side. Almost immediately after the Boshin War, Emperor Meiji tries to modernize Japan by abolishing the class system, thereby taking away special rights given to the samurai class, which means that Saigo Takamori, the hero of the Japanese Empire in this war, ends up starting a rebellion against the Japanese Empire. It's very... How the Japanese view Saigo Takamori is very complicated. Because think of George Washington. Like, think of how Americans view George Washington as this hero who fought in the American Revolution. And then think about, like, ten years after the American Revolution, he launches a rebellion against the American government. Like, it's a very weird scenario. But the Satsuma Rebellion happens about, um, ten-ish years later. Actually, more like five years later. 69? Satsuma happened in 1970, 1877. Seven years later? Very uh, within that same lifetime, Satsuma Rebellion, they get put down, and that's the last major internal conflict Japan faces. From that point on, Japan's focused on making an empire, because as Meiji hinted at during the war, um, it, that he believes that Japan needs to gain respect from the Western nations by creating an empire. Later on, he decides, well, maybe they will get, maybe they'll respect us if we defeat one of them. And then you have the Russo-Japanese War, where they defeat Russia, but they still don't have any respect. After World War I, Japan brings in the Racial Equality um, Treaty after it fought side by side with the Western powers in World War I, and then it gets rejected. And that's when Japan realizes that the Western powers will never respect Japan, no matter what it does. So Japan should fight a war of survival against the rest of the world, which would eventually lead to World War II. There's this, there's this interesting continuity of how the idea of how Japan viewed the outside world just went from one event to the other, starting, starting really with Commodore Perry's forcing of Japan to be open. But yeah, that wraps up today's video. Um, I know next week's supposed to be the Middle East one, but I really need a lot of time to gather my research notes on that next week might be the beginning of the Middle East course but um we'll have to see about that I might have to do another one shot before you know stall before I can ca actually get a uh, uh, Middle Eastern course up and ready well Dreadcore says. All right. So, thank you guys for coming out. Um, be here this time next week. 
Don't know. Not, not sure exactly what we're co we'll, what we will cover, but we'll see what we can do. Thank you guys so much for coming out to the stream, and have a good day, ladies and gentlemen.